and we're so excited. And we're so excited to have you here. And what we're going to focus on tonight is how to play the opening in backgammon. Now we happen to have, I've got five of these books. And if you're interested in us sending you one at the end or anytime during, just write in the comments. You can do that on the bottom. Just send us a note and say you're interested. And then uh, put your email address in there. And the first five that we get, we'll go ahead and send them off. So uh, but what was interesting is I went back, Bill, and I looked at your blog for the last year. Mm -hmm. Not one blog on opening moves in one year. Yeah, that's right. I was, I mean, I was writing the book, so that's where the opening problems went. Well, and, but what's interesting uh, is it's not a topic that everyone spends time on because they all assume that the opening role, we know those. God, we learned those so early on. But why don't you, before we get to the, the points you're going to make, and Karen's going to share her screen in a minute, minute to go through that. Walk through why that why it's not as easy as memorizing opening moves. Like what's the going into it? What kind of factors are there? And why is it so important to write an entire book on the opening move? Okay. Um, the opening move itself, you know, how you, you know, first move of the game, that's easy. You can memorize that even without understanding exactly why you're doing what you're doing. You can just memorize what the computer says the best plays are. There's only, um, you know, there's only a few actual opening roles. And so you can, you can learn those and put in a little more effort. You can learn the replies without really understanding perhaps the nuances of why one, one reply is a little better than another reply. But once you get in beyond the second move, the reply to the opening move, once you get to the third, the fourth, the fifth move, you're still in the opening. But now you've got to, if you're going to play it well, you've got to understand what's going on and why you're doing what you're doing and what how you think about a position in that stage of the game. And that's not so easy. Um, I think I explained it okay in the book. I think I at least gave people a grasp of what it is that good players think about when they're still very early in the game and they roll some number that can be played three or four different ways and how they whittle it down to saying, okay, I think this move is best and that's what I'm playing. Uh, and you're constantly, no matter how long you've been playing, you know, the, the number of moves expands so exponentially that by the time you get to the fourth or fifth move, you've got a very good chance that you're looking at a position you've never actually encountered before. And you just have to figure it out. Why, you know, I rolled a 4-1. Why is this play better than that play or this third play here? Which one is best? And the reasoning process that at least I go through, and I think I don't think I'm unique at this at all. I think most good players go through roughly the same process, um, is one that will often, you know, get you to the right play. But it's not a reasoning process that most intermediates and beginners use they think they think more in terms of what's the rule for this position and if i can remember what rule applies here you know always make your five point if you can or always hit if you can or always do something if you can um in a certain kind of position that, that they've got it down pat and it's the reality is nothing like that the reality is you look at the features of the position and you, if you're considering move A and move B, you ask yourself, okay, which move does this feature favor? Which move does that feature favor? Which move, about this, how about this third feature? Which one does that help? And often you'll find that even though move A and move B look sort of equivalent in your mind, you may find that three or four important features of the position favored A and only one favored B. And once you get to that point and say, oh, okay, I'm, I'm making play A. And, you know, given the, the nature of backgammon, it's a fast game. You have to do that process pretty quickly in your head. But it's it's not impossible. And I think I in the book, I laid out, you know, roughly what it looks like to kind of look at a position and think about it properly. Well, great answer. Great answer. So, uh, Karen, if you want to share your screen, we're going to get started and we're going to turn it over to you. And I do have a couple questions at the end to wrap it up. And thanks again for being here, Bill. Everyone's so excited to have the opportunity to learn from you. No problem. 
All right, Bill. Uh, mm -hmm. Welcome. Glad you're here. Hi, I'm, Karen. How you doing? I think our audience can see your position one with a 6-2 on the board. Uh, let's see. I'm not seeing it, so... Um... I, mean, I know what it is, but I don't. Yeah, Karen. Yeah, now you go. No, hold on, Karen. We're almost there. Okay. Hold on. Okay, we're there. Okay. All now, right. Karen, <laughs> Karen, if you go up to slideshow at the top and click on that, then we won't see everything else. We'll just see. We'll just see that. So, click on it. Huh? Oh, you're. I think you've got a PDF. It's fine. We'll just. This will be fine. Okay. Yeah. Looks clear. Okay, so we're early in the game. Looks like White's made one move, namely 6-1, making his bar point, and Black has done a couple of things and now has Black's bar point. Um, and White has this 6-2 to play. Now, you can look around, and there's, there's three moves that you ought to consider right off the bat. Um, one is running out, 24-16. to 16. One is 13 to seven, putting a third checker on the, on the bar point and then splitting your back checkers. And one is 13 to seven and 13 to 11, bringing down two builders. So you look around the board, you, you wanna make sure you didn't miss anything, um, but there really aren't, isn't a fourth play here. Those three are the only three I would consider. And it's not immediately obvious that any one of these three is correct. So this is something uh, you would start to puzzle about over the board. And the way I would sort this out is to look at different features of the position and ask myself, you know, which one is favored? Wh which one does this feature favor? Um, first thing I notice is Black's inner board is very weak. You've still only got the six points. Okay, so what does that favor? Well, it favors running. Because when you run from 24 to 16, the downside, what you're worried about, is that you'll get hit with a four. That's the problem with the running play. But the weaker Black's inner board is, the less you have to worry about that. With, a, with just a one-point board, even if you get hit, uh, you can come in easily. So that feature favors running. Okay, next feature, um, Black's midpoint strip. That strongly favors running because the cost of being hit's now very low. Uh, in order to hit you, Black has to surrender the midpoint and that's a loss. That's Black will do it. Black will cheerfully hit you with a four, but gives up the midpoint in the process. And that's not, you know, that's not a big net plus. So the, the strip midpoint that Black has says, okay, uh, that, that feature favors running more than anything else. Um, now, third feature I look at is White's midpoint. And White's midpoint is no longer stripped. And that means that uh, running is, that also favors running because White doesn't have to think about, do I need to pull a builder off the midpoint just to unstack it? Uh, some, uh, if, if White had five checkers on the midpoint, the answer to that question would be, yeah, pulling a checker off the midpoint would be a very high priority. But that's not the case here. The midpoint isn't stripped anymore because White used a checker to make his bar point with it. So that also favors running. And lastly, and actually this is the most important feature. White started the game with 6-1 and created what I call in the book, the 6-1 formation, where you've made your bar point, but your, your six points stacked and your bar and your eight are stripped. Now, the problem with that is it's very hard to improve your game easily from here, namely by making inner board points without giving up something important in return. You you know you roll a two one or a three two. You'd like to you know use the checker on the four, use the checker on the bar point to make something inside, but you have to give up the bar to do it. 
Um, so this is a relatively weak formation given that a new point has been made. And when you're in the 6-1 formation, as you are here, that strongly favors running as your basic game plan over building. So when you run through this list of different features that you're looking at, every one we listed favors running. Either running is, is uh, absolutely favored in the sense that it looks like it's going to result in a better play, or the downside of running is less than it usually is, for example, if you get hit. And once you run through all of that in your head, it should be clear. Four zip, running wins. I'm playing 24-16. Now, that's much better than trying to say, what's the rule here? There isn't any rule here. Uh, there's no rule that says you have to run or you have to pull down builders or anything else. This, this is not a rule-based concept here. We're, we're, we're simply looking tactically at the features of the position and trying to say, okay, which play does this feature favor? Which play does that feature favor? And, you know, you'll, experience will sort of tell you what features you're looking at. Um, and once you start looking at them, it becomes pretty clear, okay, running is the right idea here. Must be the right idea. Oh, uh, let's see. Message here from Stuart Katz. Rollout. Yeah, rollout says running's correct by a solid amount. It's not a blunder to do something else, but it, you know, it's in the 0.05 range. Now we've got a question here, Bill. Some uh, Stuart Katz would like to understand better about the rollout here. Um, in terms of what a rollout is, or or what happens? Yeah, I think I think defining it might. It's a good good place to start. Oh, okay. Well, a rollout just means that XG um, sits down and plays this position out to a conclusion, however many times you tell it to. Um, Twelve ninety six is kind of the default that comes along. Although you could, if it was close and you were really interested, you could let it run overnight for 10,000 times um, and be pretty sure you're, you're getting the right answer. If you tell XG, play this position out, you know, a thousand times, the result, you could be very confident the result is, you know, the right answer. Um, actually, the way I learned how to play, because I, I started playing, I was living in Boston. There weren't really any world-class players in Boston. And what the way I learned the game basically is I would write down interesting positions, take them home and roll them out by, you know, usually I, I do like uh, um, 112 or 110, 112 uh, iterations. And I'd accept that as the right answer, whatever I got. And over time that made me a better player and didn't cost a dime. <laughs> Unlike brutally learning in a chouette for high stakes. Bill, this yeah, is, rollouts are an essential tool. Bill, this is Karen. Um, Mochi and Mark Olson have a new book out, uh, Back in World Class, mm -hmm. uh, where uh, Mochi says the dice determine your game plan. <laughs> you don't determine your True. game plan. Uh, but he emphasizes uh, assessing whether your opponent is playing a priming game or a blitzing game. Uh, this obviously uh, could lend itself to either, but you're worried as white about being primed. And he says that's uh, inclined you to either split your back checkers or as you say, race, rather than being stuck behind a prime. Um, do you find that helpful to think about this? I know you emphasize so much. It's not a set of rules that are universally applied. It depends on all kinds of factors in any unique situation. Yeah, I have. I got Mochi's book a little while ago. I'm actually reading Tardieu's book right now. Uh, so I haven't got to Mochi yet. He's he's next on my list. Uh, and then Alex Isigian, I think, has a back game book that... Uh, I'll probably have to take a peek at, but I haven't I haven't got that yet. Um, 
from the descriptions I've heard of Mochi's book, I'm not sure it really represents how good players think. Um, in this position, for instance, I don't have a game plan. Um, I got to see what the dice are giving me and then just see how it looks tactically. But um, this is this is too amorphous as yet. I mean, nobody's made an inner board point. So uh, this could go any which way. Um, the fact that both sides have made their bar point and that both sides have a big stack on their six says to me, this is not going to turn into a priming game on average. And it's probably just going to be a game where you try to run out or at least make an anchor quick and then see where you go from there. Um, I'm not big on, you know, grand concepts uh, applied to backgammon. And then you try to, given that you have this concept of what kind of game you're in, uh, you look around for the right play. Um, I think like chess, backgammon is 99% tactics. And the explanation I gave at the beginning on this position kind of illustrates that. I mean, I'm just thinking tactically, if I do, you know, which what favors what play and trying to see if, if there's a preponderance of positional features that favor play A over play B. Um, but I'm not looking at this and, say, and saying, I, I know what kind of game this is going to be, except to say this is unlikely to turn into any kind of priming game because you've got these big stacks that have to be unwound and that's going to be tedious. And, um, you know, this is more likely going to be a holding game or a race or some combination of both. We have one more question, and that is, I was told there are 11 in the opponent's zone, so that's a blitz formation, so don't run or split. 11 in the zone argues against splitting. doesn't argue against running. Running's fine. Uh, you want to get out of there, in fact, before those 11 checkers turn into points. Um, so splitting is dangerous when, you, when, you, when your opponent has 11 checkers because you get a lot of stuff to attack you with. Uh, but running is not. Running, in fact, is positively indicated in a situation like this. I'm hearing something, but I can't make it out. Okay. Are you ready to move on, Bill? Mm-hmm. So okay. this Ah, this is a great position. Um, because it illustrates another important idea that never really occurred in the literature before, oddly enough. I I only this is chapter 13 from the book on um uh, how to how to play in the outfield. Um, the outfield sort of got ignored for a long time. It, it just didn't seem like a, an idea, but I collected you know, well over a thousand positions for the book. And as I was sorting through them and putting them in chapters and stuff, I realized, oh, there are a whole bunch of problems in here that just have to do with what happens when you run a checker into the outfield and it doesn't get hit. What do you do with it? Um, and this in this position, White has made an anchor. He's got one checker that's hopped out to the 16 point. And what's he trying to do with that checker uh, is the question. Um, you can try to run it to safety. That's a play. Um, or you can try to you can leave it there and just try to make a building play like making the three point. For a long time, I assumed and I think most players assume if you ran a checker into the outfield and it didn't get hit, uh, your job was to bring it to safety. And if you couldn't, well, that was too bad. But if you could, that was an automatic play. And the research for the book led me to discover that it's not automatic at all. Um, the fact that you have it blot on the 16 point doesn't mean you have to pick it up because it's doing a lot of work there. It's making things a little awkward for your opponent. It's guarding your outfield, making your opponent's escape a little more difficult. Um, it's no big deal if it gets hit because your opponent has no board and you'll probably have return hits. So the 
That led to a whole chapter coming up on the outfield. And, and in particular, in a position like this, you've got a bunch of possibilities. Um, possibility one is you can safety the checker and you should do that. Possibility two is you can safety the checker and you shouldn't do it. And possibility three is you can't safety the checker, in which case, well, what do you do? Now here, um, you can safety the checker. You can play 16 to eight with your five, three. Um, or you can make your three point and that's it. There aren't, there's no play C here. Um, so what are you trying to do? Um, well, the answer is that you're, you know, you're, you're going to leave the checker where it is because it's doing a lot of good work. Um, the only upside, I, I I'll look at this position in terms of upsides and downsides. Uh, the only upside to playing it safe is that it's safe. That's it. Now, you're a little, you're down in the race here. I think the race, uh, you're down by, I think, 11 pips after you move. Um, so playing safe when you're down 11 after you play, that's not a high priority. Uh, you want, when you're down in the race, you want contact. And the checker on the 16 generates contact. So that's a plus. Um, so there is an up to, upside in the 16 to 8, which is you get safe. Um, but the downside, which is more important here, is you have reduced the contact in the position while you're behind in the race, and that's a no-no. Now, the other thing, question is, uh, is there an upside to making, is there a big upside to making the three-point? And the answer is, um, nah, not really. It's, yeah, it's a point, and it unstacks the six, but uh, the horse left the barn here. Your opponent's beyond the three point. So it's not too terribly important. Um, and the other thing is that the um, the downside of making the three point is that your opponent gets to move very freely um, and possibly hit a blot, which might be okay. Um, but the net here is that, that safetying that blot is not forced. Um, it's not even clear that it's right. Um, so leave it where it is and just go ahead and make the three point. Close play, but the, the upside of staying there slightly outweighs the downside of staying there. Uh, someone asked 2116. No, the advanced anchor is very strong, very important. The, the making the 16 point is that's kind of a nothing point. It doesn't. It doesn't do much. The you're down in the race, so the twenty one is is really essential to your game. It uh, it's back there. It's annoying your opponent who can't easily drop checkers into the outfield. Um, so no, keep the twenty one. Um, Thirteen to five is nice play. It would be right if you didn't have a play that actually made a point. Making points is better than getting ready to make points. So you can make the three. It's not the best point in the world, but it's a point and it unstacks. So go ahead and make the three point. Always you're measuring plays against how good is it compared to this other play. And 13 to five, perfectly viable in a lot of situations, but now you're comparing it to making a point and it loses out there. Making a point's a bigger deal. The fact that you make the point and unstack the six at the same time, that makes it a little sweeter. Okay, I, I think we've exhausted the, uh, the questions there. Any questions about this position? Now, we're going to move on here to position three. OK, now this one's quite interesting. Um, White has escaped the checker. White rolled a 6-5 here and ran a, a back checker out. And Black has rolled a 3-1 and made the five point. So the first thing we want to understand about escaping a checker is that it's a very big deal to escape one of your back checkers. 
this was really overlooked in the literature for a long, long time. You look at books from the 80s, 70s, 80s, 90s, uh, aughts, whenever. Um, didn't talk much about what happens when you escape a checker. You know, it, it was just assumed that, well, the game, you didn't, you didn't escape both checkers, so the game just goes on. That's not quite true. Um, escaping a checker is a big deal, not just because white's ahead in the race here, but because one of your goals is to escape a back checker. And so now you have to take that into account in all your subsequent plays. Now, the first play that most people look at here is two men down off the midpoint, 13-10, 13-11. The trouble with that play is it takes the gain from escaping a checker uh, and puts it at risk because your opponent now has five ways to hit the checker on the 10, two more ways to hit the checker on the eleven. Um, that's a lot of hits that, and those hits cost you everything you've got so far. You know, you're sitting pretty here feeling like, okay, uh, I'm, I was up seven in the race, um, after, you know, the first two plays and, and now I'm rolling a five, so I'm going to be up 12 after I play, that's all that appears. So you have to ask yourself, is that play really essential? And the answer is no, it's not. Now, plays B, plays B and C are move the back checker up, uh, either two or three, and then play a checker off the midpoint with the other half of the roll. So you could go 24, 22 and 13, 10, or 24, 21 and 13, 11. I think those plays would be, you know, most players would be considering those. The trouble hit there is that. What you need to do here is consolidate your racing lead, but also start to make points. And when you put a checker on the 22 or the 21, that checker is probably going to get hit next turn. When it gets hit, you don't make any points next, but following that. You try to come in and do something else, but you really want to have your whole role next turn to, to start making points. And if you stick a checker on the 22 or the 21, your opponent will attack with everything. If he can hit that checker, he'll do it. And you don't really want that. So the, the checker on the 24 now is supposed to stay back out of danger. And that means you're down to two men down or 13-8. And the right play here is actually just 13-8. It, it takes into account the fact that you escaped a checker, which is great. And you have a racing lead, which is great. And it doesn't put any of those things at risk while it unstacks the midpoint and puts another spare on the eight, all of which is okay. To our traditional way of thinking about opening positions, 13-8 kind of rubs us the wrong way. It looks like we're being too passive. We're playing like a beginner. You know, 13-8 would be the beginner's play here. Oddly enough, beginner's play is right. Um, can't say that about a lot of positions, but you can say about it here. It, it addresses... I think Bill has frozen for a minute. Hang on, everyone. It's interesting. If you look in the comments, everybody else had a bunch of different ideas for what should be played here. So it's fun to take a minute and glance in. Okay, he's going out and coming back in. So hold on. Sorry about that, folks. I lost my network connection for a second, but it's been reestablished. I was just saying, Bill, that a lot of people in the comments are giving other options of what they thought. Uh, 1311, 1310, 13, 24, 21, 1311, 1311, 1310. Interesting. 
Yeah, well, those would have been that would have been what people were were arguing about ten years ago. Uh, you know, what's what do you do here? How much risk do you take? Um, and a big part of the the middle chapter in this in this book three is how to play when you have only one or two checker when you only have either one checker back or no checkers back. In other words, you've escaped one checker or you've escaped both checkers. And also, how do you play against that? And the first thing you want to realize is it's a big deal to escape a checker and it affects what you do next. You can't just go on autopilot and make the play that you would normally make if you had two checkers back. You've got to respect the fact that you've accomplished something here and now you've got to protect it a little bit. So, uh, Bill, oh, kids joined us. Hi, kid. Looking ahead to the next. Wait, we do have uh, one other. We have one other question. What's the second best play? <laughs> oh, uh, it's going to be 13, 10, 13, 11. It's only seven shots, and your opponent probably won't hit you, and you'll get a lot of building opportunity. Uh, you don't want to move the bet. When you have one checker back, you don't want to move that checker up until he can actually run out all the way. As with as with everything you say in backgammon, there are exceptions, but the general idea with one checker back is he stays back there where he can't be bothered, and you play on the other side of the board until you roll a racing number, and then you probably run out, but you take a look at it. Okay. You ready to move on to position four? Sure. Okay, um, this is a nice, this is a, a position emblematic of a certain type of position. So the reason I stuck this position in is the following. We are now in an era where a lot of tournaments combine both the result of the match and the result of the PR. And, you know, they've set up the, the, the new kind of world championship based upon you get a point for winning the match and a point for winning the PR and stuff. And online sites are doing that. So that's now a, a feature of the new back end. Um, so you have to take that into account. You know, you don't want to do things if you're in such a tournament, which, you know, some players often are, uh, you don't want to do things that might lose you the PR. Uh, and you, you, you have to think that way. And here's an example of, how it affects your play. Now, clearly white is a favorite here, no question. And clearly white has threats. And clearly it's a take for black if white doubles. All those things are should be pretty clear here. And the question is, for white, do I have a double or not? And that's not gonna be obvious to anybody. Um, a good player is gonna think about doubling here, He's not going to be sure if it's correct or not, um, but he's, he knows he he would know he had enough of an edge to make it sort of reasonable to double, even though it might be a little wrong. Now, the point of this position is that once you have gone that far in your reasoning and you're playing in a tournament where PR counts, you are actually done. You double automatically. And the reason you automatically double is that there is a, put it this way, the reason you automatically double is if the double is a small mistake, you get dinged for that mistake, but that's all you get dinged for, that one mistake. You doubled a little too soon in, a, in an interesting position. But suppose you make the other mistake. Suppose you don't double and it is a double. Okay, you, you get dinged for that on your PR. But now the position rolls around again. And now you have another doubling decision next turn. And you may make an error there as well. You may not double when it is a double. And you get dinged for that. And we can see where this is going. You could hit a sequence, and plenty of matches show this kind of sequence, where you fail to double umpteen turns in a row, 
getting dinged each time, ruining your PR for the whole match. So I, I coined a name for this, the blockhead blockchain, uh, where you simply chain together uh, a whole bunch of little errors, ruining your PR in the process, because you didn't, you didn't in a position like that, simply say, okay, I'm better off. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it's actually a small double or a small no double, but I'm not going to take the chance that I miss doubling several turns in a row. I'm going to double now. So the new the new style of tournaments that 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 top tournaments are in, where you you know you get a point for the win, a point for the PR, essentially forces you to be a little more aggressive with the cube, because you'd rather make a, a sin of 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 commission than a sin of omission. Okay, our the next first question up on this is. Um, uh, what if the match score is zero zero, which is what he's assuming it is now? But what if the match score is two away or four away? Oh, then you don't double. Then, then see that's a situation where the double is a huge error. If you double here, uh, the cube's coming. Your opponent has to take. You're two away, four away. Uh, since doubling and then taking is going to put you is going to let you win the match. Your opponent takes and redoubles to four. And, you know, you should be playing for the gammon here. Uh, at least take a turn. So, the, the, yeah, the match score can have a huge effect on this. This was essentially we were in this position. I was assuming it was, you know, early in a long match. Okay, looks like we have a, if it's a six, you can't double if the match is seven. Yeah, that's true. If, it, if, if white has six points, the uh, white can't double here. I'm well, talking that, about that was, Yeah, that was to it. That was to a question of if it's six two would would what would you could you oh, oh okay yeah but the answer is no you can't yeah great uh, is it a double yeah it's actually a double by a teeny bit technically a double yeah so you wouldn't you wouldn't make a mistake here by doubling but we can find plenty of examples where it's not a double by a teeny bit. Um, that would be a slightly better application. Okay, another question just sent to me is, quite often when I can make the seven point or the five point, mm -hmm. um, the, when, when you're, when you're, oh, I see what they're saying. When, when you're playing on, um, it'll tell you whether you made the right move or not. And sometimes it says the five points, the right move, and sometimes the six point, and it's usually early on. Can you just take a moment and talk about, is there something they can go into to say when to do the seven verse, versus the, the five? Uh, if you're in doubt, make the five. I mean, the five is mostly right because it's an inner board point, not an outer board point. Um, if you could point on the bar instead of make the five, then yeah, pointing on the bar is probably better. Um, almost certainly, I would think. But um, you know, generally speaking, if you can make the five or the seven, you're gonna the five is gonna be right. Yes, there will always be exceptions where the bar is right for you know whatever reason. Um, but in, unless it's clear to you that the bar is right, you can articulate why it's right. Just go make the five point. It's an inner point. Okay. Okay, any other questions? I'm ready. I'm ready to answer anything. If I can't, yeah. I'll turn it over to Kit or KG. They can certainly answer. <laughs> I think, yeah, because we're done. This is the, the, These are four positions you were presenting tonight, and they were amazing. But we do have a couple minutes left. If anybody wants to ask a question uh, from outside, just take your mute off and ask away. Bill, could you say a little bit about the structure of the book, what you cover in the book? Oh, um, the first couple of chapters, we just we finish up on things like splitting and slotting and stuff like that. And chapter 13 is the outfield. You know, we've had that one position here to, to give you an idea of why the outfield is kind of a non-trivial situation. Playing in the outfield gets complicated. 
Uh, then chapter 14 was how to play with one or zero men back, uh, which is its own thing. And uh, chapter 15 is uh, our very early doubles, what they look like and you know when they might be right, when not. That chapter actually is a little weak. I should have included more examples. Since, since the book came out, uh, for some reason, I've stumbled on a whole lot of examples of correct early doubles. And I wish I'd found them earlier. They would have gone in. But um, that's the position, that's you, just a good, position you just showed us a good one. Yeah, that, that's, that's, that is a good example. But that, that's in the book. That's in section 15.4, I think. Um, but there are more than I thought positions where you have a correct double with just like one inner point made and some other improvements and stuff. Um, if I had to do it over again, I would expand that chapter. But other than that, that it just book three just kind of finishes the series with, you know, everything that uh, needed to be in and wasn't in books one and two. Okay, here's a note that came in privately. Loved, loved the book, read it twice, still trying to figure out what it means. But could you go through a proto back game and what those positions, you say that they obey their own set of rules. What are those rules or can you go over that a little bit? Um, I can try, but it's its own huge subject. Um, a proto back game is a, at least in, in my lexicon, it's a position that has a reasonably good chance of turning into a back game, but could still morph into something else you know if you're a hundred pips behind in the race and you own the other guys 24 and 22 points you're in a back game no question about it but there's there's a gray area between just having some men back you know two three four men back and actually playing a back game uh if you've got four men back and you're 50 pips down in the race or 60 down in the race um, you're still sort of on the cusp. You're not really committed to a back game yet. And these are incredibly hard to play um, because you got a lot to take into account. You know, how good, if you go for a back game, how good is it going to be? Um, how good is your position if you try to sneak out of a back game? Um, these are, this is just, these are hard topics. Back games in general are very hard. Um, but proto back games are, are, are much harder than a position where you're a mile behind in the race and you're committed to a back game. Those are actually kind of easy. Um, good players know how to play those. But the stuff, the gray area, when you're not quite there yet, but you might be, that's very hard. And uh, um, the only kind of general advice I would give is play pure. You know, don't, don't bury checkers. Don't stack checkers. Don't be afraid to leave more blots. Make sure all your checkers are working. Uh, other than that, you know, you're just going to have to wing it. Bill, um, your older books, The 501 Problems and uh, Modern Backgammon, um, I know that Modern Backgammon, which I really enjoyed when I was uh, starting out, hasn't been uh, published. Can you give a reason why? No, it's published. Uh, I sold all the copies I published and at that point, I mean, not, avi not available, be... I mean, not yeah, available. it's not available because if I, you know, did a print run of a thousand copies, I don't know how many I'd sell, but it wouldn't be a lot. Um, I, I'd have to totally rewrite it. Um, it was an okay book for its time, um, but I wouldn't write it that way today. Okay. And uh, are the new editions of 501 Problems, for example, do you run that through... Um, uh through xg like do you yeah the, the, the new the new version came out in 2017 or 2018 and yes everything went through xg and something like 30 or 40 positions got rewritten they still had to fit in the same space as the old solution but they were rewritten um so now it's fine Okay, thanks. Uh, mm -hmm. Would you have? I I would like a, a copy of the modern backgam and just just to have it because I really enjoyed it and I I think it's a valuable book. You wouldn't have any old copies kicking around, holding up a couch or anything. No, I have uh, I have two copies and I'm holding on to them forever because hey, you, know, you only write a book once. You might have, you got to at least have an author's copy and a backup. Um, okay. So no, uh, it, it pops up occasionally on. Um, 
you know, some of the auction sites and stuff. Uh, so you can you can check in there. Um, but no, it's not going to be reprinted and I don't have any other copies to sell. Uh, I have a question and it's not related to anything you did today. It's related to something uh, uh, I found on the USPGF site. Okay. Um, uh, it's the, it's problem 157. And the question here is uh, with it, what to play with a double one. Um, and uh, your play that you recommend was 6431, meaning make this uh, the four point and uh, um, um, no, no, go to the four point, but make the one point. So um, whatever. Yeah. Uh, and I'm sitting there looking at that and I'm like, but why do I not want to move to the uh, from t 21 to 20 with two uh, checkers? I know that uh, it takes away their sixes, but if I move up, uh, uh, wouldn't it be easier uh, uh, to hit if they have to open on 15 or 17? I don't yeah, know if you have what, the What book are we open. talking about here? It's on the, on the USBGF site, the challenge. The challenge? The Bill Roberti challenge. I would have to go look at it. I don't. Yeah. Offhand, I don't. I, I don't was even thinking this. about sending you an email because it. Uh, uh, yeah, uh, send me an email. I, I'll I'll find it and and. Uh, oh, okay, uh, I can take your pictures and put them in the email. But it's it's up on yeah, the USPGF site. Take a picture side. and put it in the email. I'll send you an answer. Uh, thank you. Mm -hmm. And I think we have KG want, wanted to make a couple comments. Oh, don't let him in here. It'll be some sardonic, vaguely humorous comment, I'm sure. Uh, actually, no. Um, very sadly complimentary. Um, oh, I, of oh. course, have, have um, uh, read through uh, all three volumes of How to Play the Opening and Backgammon, originally thinking I'm much too clever and much too educated to learn anything, but I'll do my friend Bill a favor and at least read them so I can point out the stupidities that he's written about. He's a wonderful proofreader, by the way. Anybody who's thinking you. of writing a book, get this guy to be your proofreader. Um, they are, it, it, it's it's hard to imagine, actually, but the series of How to Play the Opening and Backgammon is simultaneously a beginner's book and an expert's book. Um, I learned plenty uh, reading through all three volumes uh, and was surprised at how certain things that, uh, you know, the way I thought about things since, you know, 50 years ago, uh, some of it wasn't quite right. And so, I, you know, I had to unlearn some, and I did that by reading Bill's books. And then a second thing popped up recently. I was going through a match that um, Kit Woolsey and John O'Hagan had played uh, in Vegas. So it might have been the finals. And I was sharing... You know, I transcribed the whole thing and shared my thoughts with Kit and John O'Hagan, who's a, both are extremely strong players. And in the back and forth of the comments, one of the positions which came up in Kit's and John's match involved three back checkers uh, fairly early in the game, three back checkers. And should you should you make a point an anchor with the three back checkers or when is it right to spread all three back checkers out? And as I'm exchanging comments with Kit and John O'Hagan, John writes, oh, did you see position such and such? There are three back checkers. And just like in Roberti's chapter, the McGreal split, I'm reading the book and I see my position in it. And this is spectacular. <laughs> That's a, that is one of the best players in the world, reading Bill's book and viewing it not as a beginner's book, but as an expert's book and learning from it. And he shared that with me just a couple of weeks ago. So there's a, a, a big tout for the book. And it's, you know, again, it's difficult to say it is both very much an expert's book and a beginner's book at the same time. Anybody who plays backgammon can get something out of this. And it'll very likely help sort out the way you think, whether you're an expert or a beginner. So if you're a beginner, you can pretend you're an expert when you find all these things that are interesting in it. So. Well, if you're a beginner, I mean, what I tried to do in the book was to show people how to think about the early part of the game. And if you're a beginner, that's going to save you a lot of dead ends and, and you know, misconceptions along the way. Um, so, yeah, a beginner could read it. it, it it's going to be hard going for a beginner. But, uh, yeah, yeah. Um, 
it would it would clarify some things that otherwise would take you a long time to get to on your own. Well, this was great. I, we don't know how to thank you. Karen, do you have anything you want to add or last question? Uh, Bill, you're such an encyclopedia of knowledge. Uh, but uh, and you remember everything from <laughs> decades past. Uh, I'm just curious how play 20, 30 years ago would differ from what you're saying uh, you would do today. Um, All right. Well, backgammon has these different eras. Uh, you know, the 70s were one era in which, you know, there were the, the good players of the 70s were miles better than the bad players of the 70s. But in the 70s, everyone is floundering around trying to, you know, put together a conception of the game that worked. 20 or 30 years ago, you're still not in modern backgammon, but you're getting close. People technically had improved quite a bit from the dawn of the computer era, you know, the first computers that could actually play pretty well um, up until that point. I'm thinking in the year 2000, roughly at this point. Um, since then, what's happened is that the technique that the computers were teaching us has been absorbed by a lot of players. So the, the general level of play of a good player today is unimaginably high compared to 20, 25 years ago. Um, and I think that's the, that's the main difference is that the, the good players, the very good players were able to absorb, you know, what Snowy and then XG were, were telling them incorporate into their game and become players who could play at a PR of somewhere between, you know, two and a half and four and a half. There's now, a, it used to be that made you the best player in the world. Now it makes you one among, you know, 30 or 40. Um, and I would say that's, that's really it. It just took a long time for all of that to eat for each player to kind of absorb everything they could absorb and raise their game to that level. But it's it's kind of happened. Um, other than that, you know, it's it's people are just continuing to play and you know study, try to get better. Uh, such a great question. Anybody else want to weigh on in on that, Kid or Art or anybody? I forgot the question. <laughs> Oops. <laughs> Question on how, 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 how did no, you, it, how did you approach 20, yeah, 20 years ago versus now? It's amazing to look at matches from the 70s and just realize these were thought to be the best players in the world. Um, but in those days, everything was everything was up in the air. You know, you had these wildly different styles. Um You'd look at someone and you'd think they were a fish, only it turned out they were, you know, one of the best players in the world because they weren't playing like you did and and whatever. Um, and people's people's play fluctuated enormously. Um, I'll tell you a funny story about that. Um, the first time I ever played a long match against a very good player was in the first round of an invitational tournament. This is fall of 78. And they, what, what happened was they got the idea of an invitational event in which 16 players would all play the first round around the country in different spots. And then the last eight surviving would meet in Vegas, where it was a big Vegas tournament, and, you know, play down to a conclusion. Um, so I was, I was from Boston. I was, you know, supposed to be a young up-and-comer. So they, I got paired with Paul McGrill in the first round. Okay, well, that was, I figured, well, this is going to be a great learning experience because I thought I'd gotten better. Um, I didn't know how much better. I didn't know if I could play with these guys or not. I'd never played a top player before. So Paul and I, um, you know, played, the, the, we played our match. The matches were best three out of five seven-point matches. And Paul and I played in Boston at the same time as a Boston tournament was going on. So we had a big crowd watching the, the match. And I ended up winning three matches to one, which made me feel great. But Paul was a total gentleman. Uh, after the match, he he had his girlfriend record the whole match. And then afterwards, we went aside and Dan Harrington joined us. 
And we basically got a 10 hour lesson from Paul. We went through the whole match. He pointed out, you know, my various errors and stuff and this and that, and all very instructive. So years later, uh, I got knocked out in the next round by a lady from North Carolina, uh, Marie Reynolds, good player. Um, years and years passed and eventually you know the bots came along and finally when xg was here i decided to put the four matches of, of that match uh, into xg and just see well uh, by how much had paul outplayed me so i went through the match and uh put it all in and xg cranked and cranked and burped and spit and finally tossed out the my error rate for the match was six something, which was good for that period. And Paul's was over 10. And I looked at that and I said, how is that possible? How, first of all, how could Paul play it at 10? He was, he was the best player in the world at the time. And what on earth happened here? Um, so I, told, I, called, I called KG and we were chatting. I told him about this and he asked me one question. He said, was there a crowd watching? And I said, yeah, there was a huge crowd, like 60 people clustered around the board most of the time. And he said, that's why you won. Because it turned out that when Paul had a crowd, he played to the crowd. And so he made plays that, you know, you could rationalize, okay, this play might be right. Um, you know, you leave four blots, but there's duplication and blah, blah, blah. He would make the genius play. And... He did that over and over again, and it crushed his, his PR. So there's a there's a there's a story from the real old days of backgammon that uh, that I, I I can't resist. But it was it was a different world, you know. No one knew what to do, but everybody had theories of what to do, and it was very slowly taking shape. That's a great uh, story to end with, Bill. Uh, so so thank you for sharing that and thanks for being here uh, this evening and giving everybody a taste of, uh, of your new book. Uh, I've got a copy, as you know, and uh, look forward to getting working my way through it. And we have okay, five well, copies going you. out. We have five copies, copies going out right away. People bounced on that. So, uh, but thanks, yeah. Bill, for being here. Really grateful. All right. And don't forget to order more after you sell those five. <laughs> God, it's always something. <laughs> My pleasure. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thanks. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thanks. Thanks for putting it together, Christine and Karen. <laughs>